I asked myself what does it mean to truly get the most out of a character, and the first thing that initially came up, of course, is more of the video game logic. If you pick a character who leans towards tank, naturally you're going to want to play into the strengths of a tank, say for healer or damage or any of the sort. And for D&D characters, it's pretty much the same thing. You pick a character, you choose their strengths, and then you want to lean into their strengths. But then it goes beyond that. The next thing that you might think of, which of course I know I did, was leaning into what does the character do? Who are they? Getting the most out of them means that playing them the absolute best you can role playing as that. But I think that there is more. There is something else that is missing there that a lot of people tend to miss. Whenever I think about everybody I know who plays Dungeons and Dragons, they all play for different reasons. We like to roll dice, we like to play games, we like to have fun, but I have found one core aspect between every single player I have ever met, they want to be able to overcome the odds and face adversity head on. To overcome what is in front of them with their character strengths. It is exactly why most people play D&D, to experience new things, be in new shoes, and experience success over failure. However, one of the things you have to keep in mind there is failure and success are two sides of the same coin. You can't have them without the other. I currently have studio lights right here in front of me, and if I hold up my hand, it casts a shadow on me. But that shadow would not exist if I did not have the light there. And the same thing comes from success and failure. Success isn't the amount of times you've avoided failure. Success is the ability to overcome failure despite it being a potential, and I think that is one of the core aspects of what makes playing a D&D &D character the most fulfilling is knowing that you've overcome failure. Speaking of success and failure, knowing what makes overcoming a challenge actually rewarding is a huge part of game design. Which brings us to a seamless transition to our sponsor for today, Southern New Hampshire University. Southern New Hampshire University is one of the largest accredited online degree offerings in the country, and today I specifically want to talk about their game development program. As somebody who has a lot of friends who study game development, I can say that I've seen firsthand how important it is to understand game design in order to actually run D&D games. You don't have to know it, but it is so incredibly helpful in letting you know what rules there are so you can break them and bend them to make the game work how it needs to. SHNU game development program allows you to learn things like C Sharp, C++, and Java, as well as learning different coding techniques and how to 3D model. On top of this, they also help you learn how to be able to develop game interfaces as well as different graphics and basically everything that you're going to need to be able to run or create a game. These skills are incredibly versatile, especially for TTRPG players. It's amazing how much of this actually does translate to running your own game. Right now, they're partnering with the channel to be able to give you guys the best deal possible, and so if you go to the link in the description, you actually can see what an average salary is for somebody working in this position. It is an amazing opportunity and can go so much into just more than your career, but it will also do an awesome job in helping boost your career and get you where you're hoping to go. Once again, check the link in the description for more information. And back to the video. The problem with this is it can lead to a lot of disappointment, especially when it comes from a DM side. See, consider this. You're playing as the DM and you're setting up an adventure for the players. They're supposed to go fight a beholder and it's going to be an awesome epic battle. You have been setting up for this for several different sessions now, and now it is time to finally face the big villain. So they go into the lair, they face down the giant beholder, and initiative is never rolled. Instead, the players decide to circumvent this by talking with the Beholder. See, you have a party that is full of incredible adventurers, but they are also very intelligent and very empathetic. They tend to talk to most enemies that they come across, and they tend to understand what their enemies are going through. In fact, they've built themselves to be this way, with certain spells like glibness, etc., to be able to bolster up their ability to talk to their opponents. And so they go in, they discuss with the Beholder, and they come to a conclusion that the Beholder is simply acting the way it is because of the nightmares which it has, which then create real-world problems. Now they have to go and find a different magic item that's going to prevent the Beholder from creating those nightmares. The thing is, as a DM, this could be disappointing because what you've just done is you've set up this big combat encounter that you were excited to run and you might initially think, no, I'm not going to let you guys just talk your way out of this. That's not a satisfying conclusion. We've been building up to this for several sessions and now you haven't actually faced down the villain. There wasn't that chance of failure. At least it seems that way. The thing is, is the players did succeed over failure in the things that they were excited to do and what they built their characters for. The Bard took glibness, the Warlock has high charisma, and the Rogue took expertise and persuasion. They all made themselves to be good at this, and the failure was having to actually fight the Beholder. If they fought the Beholder and won, if they killed it, they still would have lost based off of what they made their characters to do, which was to be able to communicate, to be able to understand, to circumvent things past violence. And as a DM, you have to be able to understand what your players are going for, you have to understand what they're excited for, and that can be exceedingly difficult, especially if you're not paying very close attention. 
It can be so difficult to be able to communicate with your players about what they're hoping to do because a lot of the times the players will take a little bit of a secretive stance with the DM. It's understandable because you want to be able to have that moment of surprise. Whenever we're watching media or a TV show and the hero breaks out something we didn't expect in order to save the day, a lot of the excitement comes from the expectation of what was going to happen and then the subversion of that expectation. If there's a villain pointing a gun at Bond and he pulls the trigger, we expect that the bullet's going to hit Bond. But if he somehow manages to escape that either with a bulletproof vest or the incredible ability to dodge a bullet midair, the subversion of the expectation is what made that exciting. And so when it comes to playing Dungeons & Dragons, many players want to have that subversion for the DM, for the other players at the table, because that's what they feel makes it exciting. The difficulty is, is the DM is the narrator. They are the creator of this story. In order to make that subversion make sense in a show, you have to have the writers, the directors, and the actors all on the same page. And if you're not going to tell your DM about what you're expecting, about your desire to subvert expectations, then you're really just shooting yourself in the foot. Shoot me in the foot. What? Shoot yourself in the foot. Many people look at things like Critical Role where these sort of things happen and they surprise the DM and everybody gets super excited and they want to emulate the same energy that happened, such as when Laura tricked Matt. Have you ever had the blueberry cupcake? <sighs> I don't believe I have. See, I'm using my fingers to break it in half. <laughs> Oh my god. Make a persuasion check. <laughs> 24. She reaches out and grabs the other half of the cupcake. It's so small in her long, oh. curled fingers. Kind of. That was sprinkled with the dust of deliciousness. <laughs> okay. A dust that makes food taste much better. <laughs> <laughs> and it also gives you a disadvantage on wisdom checks and wisdom saving throws. Okay. And I'm going to cast Modify Memory. Oh my god! Hold on. Hold on. My hurts slow, but. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh no. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm going. Well, I'm going to see if it works. Come on, come on, come okay. on. Okay. Did I succeed? Yep. <gasps> what? That was a very unique scenario and one where I think Matt was a little lenient. You see, Laura offered the cupcake and at that point she did not explain what her plan was. And because of this, Matt would have fully had the ability to go back and say, no, you didn't tell me you were doing that. We would have had to have a roll. We would have had to do a sleight of hand check. We would have had to see if it was possible. But Matt saw the excitement in the player's faces and knew that Laura had just experienced her player character strength. She had leaned into what Jester was good at and so he allowed it. While yes, any DM would have fully had their right to go back on what just happened, Matt truly chose to embrace what had occurred. And that was incredible, but it's not always going to happen. You can't rely on your DM to do that because essentially you're blindsiding them. And that's unfair. They're trying to tell a story that's satisfying for everybody and you can't always hit them up the side of the head with a new plot twist. Unless of course the DM has expressed that they're okay with that. So what do you do if the DM is not okay with that? Well, you communicate with the DM. One of the things that I think is incredibly important to do for all players when they're playing the player characters is to communicate with the DM before the campaign starts, typically at a session zero, in private if they desire, what it is that they want their character's core fantasy to be. What is the perfect quintessential moment for your character? If you're playing a barbarian and your quintessential moment is that you want to be able to hold up the giant stone door that's falling down, communicate that to the DM so that the DM can then begin to work to make sure that that can happen at some point in the campaign. And when it does, you as the barbarian player know 100% unequivocally, this is my moment. The DM wants me to do this. 
this is the time to go all for it. And that makes it so much more exciting for everybody else at the table because they don't necessarily know that you and the DM have had this conversation. All you know is that the barbarian is going towards the giant stone door that is definitely too heavy for him to lift and he's gonna try it anyway. Now the failure aspect is there. We know that the DM wants them to succeed, but we know that they're probably still gonna have the barbarian roll, but the rest of the table doesn't know that the DM and the Barbarian are on the same page here and they want this Barbarian to succeed and the DM's gonna give them absolutely every chance they can to succeed. Now that doesn't mean you just let them automatically get the nat 20 because, well, obviously everybody knows what happens and never forget, the nat 20 is only exciting because it could have rolled any of the 19 other numbers. So you have to understand that when you are going for that core fantasy moment, the moment your character's been waiting for, there's a possibility they'll fail. And that's a good thing because that's what's making it exciting for everybody else at the table, including you. And yes, the failure will suck. It won't feel good, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't take the chance. If we looked at failure as an option and automatically assumed that because it could happen, we shouldn't take that chance, we're not really living and we're not having a lot of confidence in ourselves. The thing is, how do you avoid those types of scenarios and actually end up making it, well, what you're hoping for? Because it can be extremely difficult. I remember there was once upon a time I played a gunslinger named D'Artagnan, and one of the things that he did was he would often point his gun at people, which mind you, this was in a world where guns didn't exist, and he would say, Tell me, friend, do you know just how fast a piece of metal has to go to pierce straight through your skull? At this point, when they would say no, he would explain to them in excruciating scientific detail how his gun was capable of doing that. However, I don't think this ever once worked for an intimidation tactic, and there was one specific reason why he had a six charisma, literally. He was one of the most uncharismatic bastards that could ever exist, and so it never worked. Now, it was kind of annoying because, yeah, it probably should have worked, but that's just not what he was good at. That wasn't his strength. However, there are rules in the DMG that are not even variant rules. They're just base rules that actually help achieve the goal that your players are trying to go for. On page 239 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, it explains that you can use different ability scores for skills that you have proficiency in. What this means is if you're incredibly intelligent, you can use your intelligence to make a persuasion or intimidation check as long as you have proficiency in that skill. This means that you can play into your character's strengths without necessarily having to have those specific ability scores and that can make it way more entertaining. And it's, again, not even a very rule. It is something that your dungeon masters can just do, but they don't necessarily have to. But if you want more flexibility and the ability to do that kind of stuff, I think it's an awesome method. But what happens if you're just playing in a game that doesn't play into the type of strengths that you want to do? Another character I played was Jasper. He was a divine soul sorcerer and cleric multi-class, and I made him to be the ultimate healer. And he was damn good at it. The problem was, is what I didn't take into account was we weren't playing in a combat focused game. It was incredibly role play heavy, which I enjoyed, but I can't really count a single time where his healing was actually necessary. It just wasn't something that was necessary for the campaign. It's not the type of campaign we were running. Rarely were our characters ever in danger. Because of this, it became exceedingly difficult to find a way to make everything work how I wanted to. I wasn't able to play into my character's strengths. And that's honestly partially on me, if not fully. I changed characters mid-campaign to play Jasper. I should have known that was the campaign we were in, and it is something to take into account. During session zeros, when discussing with your DM, find out what type of campaign is going to be played and make a character that you're excited about, but one that will be able to flourish in this campaign. But that's not all that I'm focusing on here. Yes, mechanics are great, don't get me wrong, but there are other strengths that you can focus on too and that's the character themselves. When you're role-playing, it's important to know what your character's good at and what they're bad at. And that's really what makes a more exciting game as a whole, isn't it? Because you know what you're good at. You can go experience being an awesome fighter and doing really good at fighting, but maybe your character's also just a very stoic individual. And so when you run into a bunch of ghosts that cause everybody to get feared, and your character, whether they get feared or not, they're able to shake it off afterwards because they've been through a lot. They know a lot. Their strength is in the fact that they're steady they don't get easily pushed around. And so they could stand up for the other player characters, or they can make sure to comfort them because they know what it's like to be scared, but they also know what it's like to push past that fear. Furthermore, that character may not be very good at talking with people. Even if they have a decent charisma score, they may not just feel comfortable in a social setting. And so leaning into that weakness and letting another player shine is what D&D is all about, isn't it? It's allowing them to be able to experience their strengths to supplement the weaknesses of everybody else that's why you have a D&D party. That's why you brought all these characters together so they can all be a party together and enjoy 
the strengths and weaknesses of each other. In life, it's very similar. What, what life is all about is finding out what your weaknesses and your strengths are. As you discover who you are, you have to find out what you're good at. You have to find out what you're proud of. And when you accomplish something that you're good at, when you overcome the odds with that skill that you know that you are talented at, that feels good. You can get lucky about something else. You could be pretty bad at a social setting, but still manage to overcome a challenge. And yes, that's great, but you know that you just got lucky. But when you overcome an incredible odd with your own strength, with what you know you were good at, that feels good because that's what you were made to do. And you know that that is what you put pride in. But in the same vein, you do have to understand your weaknesses. You have to find out what you're not good at. And yes, it is important to improve on those weaknesses, but they're always going to be weaknesses in some part. Otherwise, you wouldn't be you. You wouldn't be human. And so in D&D, it's very, very similar. When you're looking at the characters, when you're looking at what it is that you're playing, you want to embrace your weaknesses just as much as you embrace your strengths. And that is what it truly means, at least in my humble opinion, of how to get the best out of a character. When you really want to embrace a character, when you really want to optimize the hell out of them, in order to do so for the best game possible, you have to embrace your weaknesses and your strengths and know that the other players will be there to offset your weaknesses. That's why we play D&D in a party. That's why everybody's there. Think about it. The very base of the game is the archetypes, the classes, the barbarian, the rogue, the wizard, etc. In the very first editions of D&D, there were only very few and all of them were made to supplement the other's weaknesses and provide their own unique strengths. So when you think about it today in the game of D&D 5e and as we move into 1D&D where customization is king and you're allowed to do anything you want, the point still is not to be a one-man show. That's not the idea of the game itself. It's to allow everybody to come together and work as a party to overcome the odds. Failure is a huge portion of Dungeons and Dragons and you're not gonna get around that. It's always going to be a thing, but the true act of playing D&D is overcoming that failure or experiencing it and embracing it. It's one of the most fun aspects of the game and also one of the most important aspects of life. Learning about that, embracing it, improving on yourself and understanding exactly what you're going to have to overcome at the end of the day because we're exploring who we are and what it is that we want to experience. And I think, that's one of the best experiences you could possibly have. A huge thank you to the YouTube members without which this video wouldn't have been possible. A special thank you to Corey Wood, Big D the Cool Guy, Ace Pizza Guy 22, Stormsaw, Emily Mayers, and Agile Monk for subscribing at the Roll Slayer tier.